Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll hear about the budget and other legislative issues from minority leadership. We'll find out about a study on how to turn food waste into energy, and we'll check out a photography exhibit that features rich, subtle tones. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The Arizona Supreme Court today refused to allow Maricopa County to retry Deborah Milkey for arranging the 1989 murder of her four-year-old son. Milkey spent 23 years on death row, but in 2013, her conviction and death sentence were overturned by the Ninth Circuit, citing, quote, egregious prosecutorial conduct. The case was returned to the state, where an appeals court dismissed the murder charge, which led to an appeal by Maricopa County to retry the case. Today, the state Supreme Court turned down that appeal. Milky has filed suit against Phoenix and Maricopa County for malicious prosecution. She is now a free woman. The two men convicted of actually committing the murder remain on death row. Well, state lawmakers continue to work on a variety of bills. This after dealing with a controversial budget that is still raising questions. Here to talk about what's left to be done at the Capitol and what they want to see done before lawmakers go home is Senate Minority Leader Katie Hobbs and House Minority Leader Eric Meyer, good to see you both back here again. Thanks, Thanks for, for having us. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's start with the budget. We haven't had you here since the budget was passed. Your thoughts? Um, well, it's a bad budget. It takes Arizona in the wrong direction. Um, the governor has said it's balanced, and it's not balanced when you shift those costs onto municipalities, um, hospitals, schools, and, and the poor. That's what this budget does. Impact uh, uh, Democrats had on this budget, if any? Well, um, one Democrat voted for the budget. Yes. How do you explain that? <laughs> um, he traded for something for his district for it. I don't think it was a very good trade. Okay. And, and how does the caucus feel about it? Is, is he st he's still with the caucus? He's he's still a member of the caucus. Okay. <laughs> he hasn't participated in caucus activities. Oh, interesting. All right. Uh, your thoughts on the budget? You know, we passed a budget in the dead of night that actually none of us had seen. We waived the rules so that we could pass it. Uh, it made cuts again to education, higher education, the community colleges, our hospitals uh, across, and, and providers across the state, um, and actually gave some more tax cuts as well as invested in our prisons. So in my mind, and I think a lot of voters' minds out there, because we've been getting a lot of emails and phone calls, they're not happy about it. And yet the governor says, this is what I ran on, and more voters voted for him than the opposition. Mm -hmm. Couldn't have been much of a surprise. Well, he ran on supporting public education, and this budget doesn't reflect that, both at the university level and the K-12 level cuts. Um, he's said that these are uh, high levels of spending, but they're not. 2008 levels were higher for both our K-12 system and our universities. And now there's, I think, 55,000 more kids in the K-12 system, 23,000 more students in the university system. I think the governor also said that, though, if, if special interests aren't upset, then he's not doing his job with this particular budget. Sounds like a lot of folks, especially regarding education, none too pleased. Yeah, and what I've heard is not from special interests, but from constituents, not just in my district, but around the state, um, that are not pleased about this budget. And I, I don't think when we, if we start referring to the voters of Arizona as special interests, I think there's a problem there. This budget was universally opposed. I've never seen so much opposition to a budget from every corner of of the of every, in every sector in the state. As far as suspending the rules, uh, Senate President said this was no different than the Medicaid expansion. Uh, protocol from a couple of years ago. Has you got a point? Sure. Um, you know, this is the way we do budgets at the legislature. That doesn't mean it's the right way that we should do a budget. This is the most important document that passes through the legislature. It reflects our values and priorities as a state. And when you have to cram it through in a really quick process so that you don't lose votes um, without any public input, very little opportunity for, for public to weigh in on the impacts it will have, with major policy decisions uh, that affect a lot of people, um, that's, that's not the way we should be doing it. Okay, but, we, but when, the, when the Senate President says, though, that this was done Medicaid, mm -hmm. uh, did you disagree with that process as well? Well, I think we worked with the tools we had available to us. And I think a big difference there is that Medicaid was something that had been vetted throughout the, you know, since the governor announced it in her State of the State address. Um, and had tons of public support behind. 
Um, so it was a much more popular um, policy in terms of enacting it. And as far as an all-night session, again, Senate President says we, we went through this with Medicaid. What's the problem? Well, we weren't in charge back then either. I mean, we're, we've been in the minority the whole time. Um, we have asked for changes, for more openness and transparency. We've asked for the committee hearings like we used to have uh, 15 and 20 years ago where things were vetted in you know, the Education Committee for Education, Health Care Committee for Health. And we've moved to this process that neither Katie or I have control over. Um, we did support that budget because it was a good budget. It passed the Medicaid expansion. But again, we weren't in control of the process. As far as uh, budget fixes, are any bills out there that uh, need to readdress things? Well, we, I think there is supposed to be a trailer bill being worked on because this happened so quickly. Um, there were uh, problems. Some of them relate to funding of the Supreme Court, for instance. Um, it's unclear how that's all going to happen. Again, uh, we haven't seen that bill, uh, but it looks like we're probably going to finish up within the next couple of weeks, so we should probably be hearing about it shortly. You expecting a trailer out of this? Yeah, just we haven't seen any, any uh, what it looks like or, or anything. But yeah, cl clearly there was mistakes made in the rush to get it out. So um, As far as uh, other bills out there, I, I noticed that uh, there was a bill to create the lieutenant governor position, mm -hmm. and Democrats voted no. Didn't, you, didn't Democrats support this in the past? And what, if so, what has changed? Um, you know, I haven't had a chance to really look at the bill, but in my understanding is that it doesn't, um, uh, previous attempts have tried to replace the Secretary of State, and this one is creating a whole new elected office um, over the Department of Administration. Um, and it went through the House, so Eric might have a better answer of why the Democrats voted no on it. Yeah, so it put uh, whoever the Lieutenant Governor was, is, or was elected, in as director of the Department of Administration. So I think that was the concern. This person may be able to run a great campaign, uh, campaign along with the governor, but they may not have the experience to do that job. Is that enough to offset the concerns regarding lack of continuity with a secretary of state succeeding to a governor's office? Well, um, it was in this case for most of my members in the caucus. So I, you know, I don't uh, know that this is better or worse. I think the idea that they'd be running one of the large agencies in the state was the issue. Uh, back to the budget real quickly. I know that the governor got $24 million to back loans for uh, privately owned charters, um, but we still don't have the details. on What have you been hearing about this? Um, so we were kind of waiting to see a proposal that came out of his office, and his office announced today that they don't believe they need legislative authority to create their plan. So we just appropriated $24 million for this uh, whatever access our best public school fund with really no um, oversight about how that fund's going to be created. Um, so they're going to try to create it, I guess, through executive order without legislative approval um, is what it sounded like from his announcement today. And again, this, this allows charters to get the lower interest rates by way of the state credit being the backing. Right. Uh, thoughts? Well, it could be unconstitutional. There's a gift clause. We aren't supposed to be giving away state assets to corporations, which this is in my mind. Secondly, um, you look at all the things that we cut, uh, and whether it was K-12 education, funding for the neediest kids, child care subsidies, that $24 million could go back into the classroom, for instance, somewhere, or help to pay down the inflation lawsuit. And instead, it's been you know kind of sucked out of the budget, put in a a special account that the governor has control over, and um, in my mind, that's not what the people of Arizona want. They want, you know, teachers in their classroom. Um, they want uh, their kids to be safe in their streets. They want their kids to have food, um, and we, he didn't do that with these dollars. Yeah, last question: Everything we've talked about tonight. Obviously, Democrats are in opposition, and they're not happy with what's gone down uh, at the Capitol. And yet, uh, the governor won rather handily, and the and, and lawmakers. That most lawmakers won rather handily. Um, how do you explain the disconnect, if there is indeed a disconnect between voters and the legislature? Um, well, I don't. I think a lot of voters are seeing kind of now what the governor meant when he campaigned on balancing the budget and that it would be painful. I um, I don't know that a lot of voters are really happy with that. Um, a lot of the Folks on the majority side are really happy with the conservative budget that they were able to vote on as well. Um, you know, 
it's, I, I don't, I think, um, I would love to see a poll right now on DC's favorability among voters. Indeed, but it, uh, you know, we, we just got through an election campaign and it really wasn't all that close. And, and the governor has had, he's had this, his, his budget out for weeks, he said before, so no one should have been surprised by the, the end result, which was similar to what he originally planned. Um, is there a disconnect? Because a lot of folks saying, we sent these people in office to do just this. Yeah, I think in a sense that people need to understand that voting in the primary is important. Most of the districts uh, across the state, probably 25 of the 30 districts, aren't competitive in the general election. Um, and when they don't vote in the primary, um, you tend to get, and for both parties, legislators that are either lean more to the right or more to the left. Um, so A, it's important to vote in the primary. Secondly, y your vote matters. Voter turnout was incredibly low this time. Um, and hopefully this will spur people to vote in 2016. Um, there is opportunity to elect people that will vote to support education in our universities and middle class families. Um, you just need to f spend some time to figure out who that is. Um, so I, I, maybe a disconnect, but I think uh, for me, in the, this now seventh year I've been down there, I think the engagement level now, the size of the protests, all those things that are going on is more than I've ever seen it. So we'll see. Maybe they gave the governor and the legislature the benefit of doubt, and now they're questioning whether they were sold a bill of goods during the election cycle. All right. We should mention we will have the uh, Senate president and the Speaker of the House on Thursday. Tonight, we thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Tonight's focus on Arizona sustainability looks at how the city of Tempe is teaming with ASU for a study that will analyze ways to turn food waste into renewable energy. Joining us now is David McNeil, Tempe's environmental services manager. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Well, thanks for having me. Converting food waste to renewable energy. Explain, please. Well, the, 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 this process happens, it's, it's, it's a process called anaerobic digestion. So. Bottom line, when you think of uh, taking organic, rich organic matter and turning it into energy, it's done uh, through a process uh, where that's depleted of oxygen and uh, microbes that uh, essentially digest uh, food or organic matter in the absence of oxygen produce gas. Same thing happens in our large intestines. Same thing that, that happens in this type of facility happens in our large intestines. You have you have organic matter, bugs create gas, uh, uh, not always at the most opportune times, but in this case we're talking about an industrial scale uh, type of process where gas is created and you capture that gas and you can use it as renewable, renewable energy in, in several different ways. Okay, so it, it, removing oxygen, you got the digestive bacteria, you break it down, this biogas is produced. How much biogas can be produced by, I don't know, a chicken sandwich? I mean, give me, give me the idea of food waste and how much gas can be produced. Well, and I think that varies depending on the source. You know, different types of food waste have different concentration of, concentrations of organic matter and different uh, energy potential. And, and that's one of the things that this study will look at is we will survey the different food, food sources that are available to us in Tempe and uh, try to quantify 
by how much gas we can produce. With those results, we can determine exactly what type and size of facility we might construct, how much gas we can produce, the value of that gas, and how long it would take to uh, uh, pencil out an investment. So the idea is to look at, at going as far as building a facility or using a faci an existing facility to kind of focus and concentrate uh, or collect? Those are two opportunities. In fact, this, what, what the study and what the partnership with ASU uh, will do in the end will will kind of pencil out three different options. And, and uh, it might be using existing infrastructure, but more than likely it'll be constructing new infrastructure uh, at different locations using uh, uh, varying forms of technology that are out there. Uh, and uh, and determine exactly what that facility would look like. It might not uh, be that uh, it would provide an adequate return right now, right. but the information we gather over the next uh, 8 to 12 months uh, will ultimately allow us to revisit uh, this, this opportunity in the future as energy prices change, as technology prices change, uh, and as uh, costs associated with capturing uh, and, and the logistics behind capturing this, uh, this food waste change. Isn't a little bit of this used in, in wastewater treatment plants as well? That's precisely where it's happening uh, already, and there are many communities out there nationwide who uh, use existing or excess capacity in sludge digestion. When you take wastewater uh, at a sewage treatment plant, you separate the water component and the sludge component. You take the sludge and you put it in an anaerobic digester, exactly, and, and bacteria break it down to, uh, to uh, lessen the quantity so it can be more easily disposed of, and that creates gas. And many, many cities uh, uh, in the nation are actually inserting food uh, and fat soils and grease and other organic matters into that process to, to boost the energy production. And we, we hear about shade tier mechanics that are getting their old diesel engines and they're putting, they make them smell like french fries when they're running up and down the street. Same kind of idea there? Or is, um, that, is that a whole different kind of process? That's that's a, a, a different process. Typically that happens when you've got a vegetable oil that yes. you capture before it's actually part of the waste stream and, and it requires much less processing. Okay, uh, all right. Uh, but, but, but very similar. So no microbes, no digestive, anaerobic, whatever it is. Right. Correct. Okay. Um, how are you going to get, how are you going to procure all this food waste? Well, you know, that's, that's uh, one of the things that we're going to look at through the study. And one of the, one of the uh, uh, things that's really unique about Tempe uh, in terms of being able to do this, being able to look at this opportunity is, is many, many people don't think of Tempe as an industrial city, but we really do have a lot of industry. We have roughly a third the number of large uh, industries of, uh, that the city of Phoenix has, despite having only a tenth of the population and a tenth of the area. And among those uh, industries that we have, roughly a quarter of them have some sort of food component or food-based large industry. So we have uh, a number of targeted uh, businesses or areas where we can look for food waste. And what we intend to do over the next eight months is not only quantify how much waste is out there, but analyze it through uh, uh, chemistry analysis, uh, determine what the energy potential or energy content is, and also look at its security, securability from an institutional standpoint. In other words, can we get commitments from some of these food-based businesses to, to uh, give us this waste over a 20-year period? If we build a facility or right. if we get third-party investing in, in, a third, in, in a facility, we need a commitment uh, mm -hmm. to have this waste stream coming into a facility for an extended period of time. What happens like, at, at, the dairy, at the dairy area, the Coca-Cola bottling plant, some of these other places? What happens to that waste now? Well, that waste is typically carried off site, and, and I, I, you know, I think that uh, some of those industries are shipping it uh, uh, off to, to folks who do some sort of recycling, uh, but it's, uh, uh, to my understanding, it's, it's, it's quite a distance away. I know that some of the waste is sent to Buckeye, some of the waste is sent to Maricopa. The opportunity uh, to not only turn it to renewable energy, but do it in a, in a, you know, kind of a closed system within Tempe would be, be a great opportunity. And, and some of our businesses have, have asked us when we're, when we're going to explore these. Interesting. All right. Well, that's encouraging. Okay. So, and, and as, again, as far as this biogas, once you get it done, once you have the bio, the gas is there, it's available for use. Available for use as what? Well, that, that's another thing that the study will look at. You know, I, I think that we believe that the lowest hanging fruit is compressed natural gas and and using it on site. So if we can capture this gas and process it minimally uh, and compress it and use it in things like uh, regional transit vehicles or city vehicles that now run on compressed natural gas, mm -hmm. that would be, uh, we believe, um, more efficient and, and have a better return than doing things like generating into kilowatts or electricity or putting it on the regional gas pipeline. We believe that 
uh, use in Tempe will ultimately prove to be uh, a, a better, more efficient uh, use than sending it elsewhere. That makes sense to me. Okay, mm -hmm. timeline for this study. What, what do you got out there? Okay, so over the next eight months, uh, uh, you know, eight to, to 10 to 12 months, we, we plan on having not only uh, a map uh, which will point to where our food waste sources are, how much waste there is in each of the, these locations, what the energy content is, uh, but also uh, you know, having a map that will give us an opportunity to look at different siting options and uh, what different combinations uh, of, of this waste could produce in terms of energy. And we plan to have that uh, report, that product uh, done by, I would say, mid-fall. All right. Well, uh, by then, we may ask you back and get some more information. Good Fantastic. to have you here. Thanks, well, thanks for joining us. Thanks very much for having me. Tonight's edition of Arizona Artbeat looks at a very special form of photography. Gold is among the most popular precious metals in the world, but in the world of photography, another metal is even more treasured. Producer Christina Estes and photographer Kyle Mounds take us to the Phoenix Art Museum. The exhibition is called All That Glitters Is Not Gold, Platinum Photography from the Center for Creative Photography. It's a chronological collection that begins in the 19th century when platinum printing was invented. And at the time, the kind of black and white photograph that was available tended to fade and to yellow. Curator Rebecca Semp says early platinum prints tended to be soft, almost like charcoal or pencil drawings, which made them popular for portraits. And one of the things we do in the exhibition is try and distinguish between a typical black and white photograph and these platinum prints. A regular black and white photograph is a gelatin silver photograph. And gelatin, just like the gelatin that comes out of your kitchen, and silver, like the metal, is what makes up the image area in a black and white photograph. In platinum photographs, the image area is made up of platinum. And so just like a platinum wedding band is a more luscious, precious thing than a silver wedding band, platinum photographs have a kind of lusciousness and preciousness that distinguishes them from gelatin silver photographs. As photography evolved in the early 20th century, a group known as the pictorialists emerged. And they were reacting to a real influx of amateur photographers. And so in order to help prove that photography could be an art form, they often imitated existing types of art. So painting, printmaking. They were trying to prove that the camera didn't have to be used like a machine and that photographs weren't just the product of this mechanistic device. Platinum's process is unique. Commercially prepared paper is unavailable, so the photographer must apply a special coating before laying down the negative. That process is called contact printing. And with contact printing, you need a big negative in order to get a big print. And so it requires a special sized camera. And so the whole process requires a kind of involvement and technical knowledge that many photographers don't have. As photographers move towards modernism, Semp says they focused on simple compositions. Oftentimes they were very abstract. So we, for instance, have a Paul Strand picture that's of sheets hanging on a clothesline. But he wasn't really, it's not a picture about sheets on a clothesline. It's a picture that gives him a chance to show shades and shapes within the photograph. Platinum photography lost its appeal during the 1950s and early 60s. But that changed when a fashion photographer began experimenting with the process. Irving Penn made this beautiful still life that really exemplifies the values and the benefits of platinum printing because it includes a number of dark tones, these metal objects, and light tones, some bones. And platinum is really good at differentiating close tones. So you can see the subtle range of tones within the darks and within the lights. The final prints in this 85 piece collection are contemporary and diverse. They include highways, landscapes, architecture, and portraits. One of the advantages of this little group of prints is you can actually see the edges of the paper and it allows you to see where the artist, Ray Mortensen, applied the platinum material right to the paper. You can actually see the brush strokes on the paper where this emulsion layer was applied. 
there's a desire to go back to a process like platinum printing and do these laborious steps because it it involves you in the final photograph in a different way. It slows you down, it requires a kind of attention and detail and patience that some people want, especially in this age where everyone has a camera on their phone and where a lot of people are making digital prints. There's a real appeal of this slower, more deliberate, more crafted photograph. Just before the exhibit closes later this month, the museum will offer a workshop where people can create their own platinum prints. For more information, go to the Phoenix Art Museum website. Wednesday on Arizona Horizon, it's our weekly legislative update with the Arizona Capital Times and hear from those opposed to Phoenix's 35-year transit plan. It's at 5.30 and 10 on the next Arizona Horizon. That's it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thanks for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.